Bing bong, bong, bing bong, bong. This is Joe, the bearded historian. He'll tell you an interesting history. Be careful of his soldiers. They can be brats. This is Angel. She's an entity. She'll cause his us and plant her hands at you. This is Sue. She likes spirits, not the alcohol. She's the reason this channel exists. This is David. He likes fire trucks. He's here occasionally. Bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong, bing bong y bong. We preserve his story. Okay. My name is from Way Back Wednesday. Joe's gonna ramble about this and that. And you're going to be awed by his knowledge. <laughs> but first, a shout out. Are you ready? I've chosen monsters because of today's topic. Ready? Shout out time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so I support you. The shout out is for our friends. Let's see who it is today. That's it. Because I forgot to do that, and I'm a genius. Start. Come on. There we go. Alright. Oops. Come on. There we go. Alright, so we've got vodka and Buddha and Anubis. Uh, I see Pete and Embark uh, Nation. Uh, Pasadena. Let's see who else can I see. Not really many people. Uh, Swamp Anderman. Spirit. All come together today. Uh, there's Eddie. Uh, let's see. There's Landon. New York girl. Heather. Nobody's. Oh, well, looks like Eddie might currently be in the lead. Uh, Lashes. He's taking. Uh, is right there with Eddie. There's she stole and watchers and sea leg. Uh, see, looks taking the lead. Ooh, you're a cryptid there, see, like. Uh, Cass. Oh, looks like see, has got it. Hang on. All right. Uh, it is see, like journeys with Robin and Shit. Uh, they are uh, cruise vloggers. I think they are one of our first cruise vloggers. They share cruise tips, review sh ships that they've traveled on, great excursion with taken. They are a sweet couple. Very cool. If you like cruising, traveling, check them out. Like, share, comment. Have a good day. There we go. All right, Mr. Bud, what are we going to tell Well, today, boys and girls, men, women, gremlins, geeks, and of course, you rub rats. We have a couple items that I wanted to bring to your attention. The first one comes from September the 12th, which is National Video Games Day. And I'm pretty sure it's probably about 99.9% .9 of people have at least played one video game in their lifetime. I, I can't think of too many that haven't, whether it's dad playing Mahjong, my mom playing Surround, even me having fun with Breakout. You know, there are so many different types of video games that it's you know pretty much a, a foregone conclusion. Now, this uh, particular day actually got a pretty healthy start back in 1983 when two fellows... Uh, Walter Day and the Twin Galaxies Intergalactic Scoreboard out of Otoma, Iowa. This is the same Otoma that was uh, renamed after the city here in South Dakota. Uh, founded the United States National Video Game Team. Now, the early games used interactive electronic devices with various display formats. Uh, Thomas T. Goldsmith Jr. and Estel Ray Mann filed the first patent for an electronic interactive device in 1947. They didn't think they had computers that far back. And it was called the cathode ray tube amusement device. Now some other early examples. Uh, the Nimrod computer at the Festival of Britain. I love that name, Nimrod. You have to be um, a Nimrod to play? Yes. Uh, a 0x0, Zero Zero, a tic-tac-toe computer game that was designed for the EDSAC in 1952 by Alexander S. Douglas and Tennis for Two, an electronic interactive game engineered by William Higginbottom in 1958 
and then Space War in 1961. Now, each game used a different means of display. Some used a panel of lights or graphical display. Others featured an oscilloscope or a DEC PDP-1 vector display. Um, it became the first commercially sold coin-operated video game. Uh, Magnavox Odyssey launched the first home console in 1972, while Atari's Pong followed with an arcade version in 1972 and a home version in 1975. Well, the commercial success of Pong led to numerous other companies to develop Pong clones in their own systems, spawning the video game industry. Now, this is where I get to play historical because uh, I had one of these when I was a kid and they were a blast. The Atari 2600 uh, VCS model originally came out uh, in 1977 popularizing the microprocessor based hardware and games on a swappable cartridge. Uh, the format originally came out with a system called the Fairchild Channel F in 1976. This uh, branded unit uh, was the primary unit that they had until 1982. It was bundled with two joystick controllers, a co-joined pair of paddle controllers, and a game, or initially combat, later they would be released with Pac-Man. Uh, the old system had six switches, the more uh, modern only had four. Now, as the systems worked, you know, Atari was successful at creating arcade video games, but their development cost and limited lifespan drove the CEO, Nolan Bushnell, to seek a programmable home system, the first inexpensive microprocessors from MLS technology in late 1975 made this feasible. Now, here's a, here's a trivia question. If anybody wants to take and put it in the comments, I don't know, maybe we'll throw them a sticker or something. Uh, the code name for the original Atari was Stella. Stella! Stella! And the su subsidiary, uh, Scion Engineering, uh, lacking the funding to complete the project, Bushnell approached Warner Communications to buy Atari in 1976. Well, the following year, Atari VCS was launched with nine simple low-resolution games on two kilobyte cartridges. Woo! And I mean, I'll tell you what, back then, that was such a thing. The VCS became widely successful. Um, the first killer app, interestingly enough, was the home conversion of Taito's arcade game Space Invaders. I remember when we had the choice to either go to the Ice Capades or go pick up Space Invaders, we opted for Space Invaders. What? Why? <laughs> because it was an awesome game back then. Um... The VCS became widely successful, leading to the founding of Activision, which was made up by other programmers and other third-party game developers in competition from console manufacturers Mattel and Coleco. By the end of its primary life cycle in 83-84, games for the 2600 were used more than four times the storage size of a launch game with significantly more advanced visuals and gameplay than the system was designed for, such as Activision's Pitfall. Uh, in 82, uh, Atari 2600 was the dominant game system in North America, amid competition from both new consoles and game developers. A number of poor decisions from Atari's management affected the company and the industry as a whole. Uh, the most public was an extreme investment into licensed games, including Pac-Man and the now-cursed E.T., the extraterrestrial. Uh, Pac-Man actually became the system's best-selling game, but the Conversion's poor quality eroded consumer confidence in the console. Uh, E.T. likewise was rushed to market for holiday shopping and was critically panned in commercial failure. Both games and a glut of third-party shovelware were factors in ending Atari's relevance in the console market. Um, the reverberation was felt all the way into the video game crash in 1983. Uh, Warner sold the Atari home division to former Commodore CEO Jack Trammell in 84, and in 86, a new Atari corporation under Trammell released a lower-cost version of the 2600 and the backward-compatible Atari 7800. But it was Nintendo that launched the recovery of the industry in the 85 launch of its Nintendo Entertainment System. Woo! Uh, production of the Atari 2600 ended in January 1st, 1992, with an estimated 30 million units sold in its lifetime. Now, 
The thing that makes it kind of interesting is Atari originally came to be back in December, uh, not December, uh, in 1972, thanks to two fellows, one Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. Now, the first major project, again, was Pong, released in 72, and the first successful coin-operated video game. Now, while Atari continued to develop new arcade games in the following years, Pong gave rise to a number of competitors with the growing arcade game market. I remember the first Pong that I played, it had a base unit that sat in front of the TV, and you had little dials. And the thing I always thought was so funny is they tried to say, well, this is tennis, this is handball, this is racquetball. It was the same frickin' game over and over and over again. But somehow they got you to buy it that you're actually playing eight different games. Yes, eight different games, all in one. All in one, right. With the same screen. Right. <laughs> well, in 75, Atari went ahead and released the Pong home console for competing against the Magnavox, the only other producer of home consoles at the time. Atari engineers recognized, however, the limitation of the custom logic integrated onto the circuit board, permanently confining the whole console to only one game. This increase in competition increased the risk, as Atari found out, uh, with past arcade games and again with dedicated home consoles. Both platforms are built from integrating discrete electromechanical components into circuits rather than programmed on a mainframe computer. Therefore, the development of the console had cost at least 100000 I figure, or $544,000 in today's money, plus time to complete, but the final product only had about a three-month shelf life before it was outdated by competition. Well then. Yeah. In 74, Atari, uh, acquiring Cyan Engineering again, a Green Valley electronics company founded by Steve Meyer and Larry Emmons, both former colleagues of Bushnell and Dabney from Ampex, who helped develop new ideas for Atari's arcade games. Even prior to the release of the home version of Pong, science engineers, led by Meyer and Ron Milner, had envisioned a home console powered by a programmable microprocessor capable of playing Atari's current arcade openings. Now, the programmable microprocessors would make the console's design significantly simpler and more powerful than any dedicated single-game unit. <coughs> now... However, the cost, uh, 100 to $300 of such chips, was far outside the range that the market would tolerate. Atari had opened negotiations to use Motorola's new 6800 in future systems. Well, in 75, Moss Technology debuted the 6502 microprocessor for $25 at the Westcon trade show in San Francisco. Meyer and Miller attended and met with the leader of the team that had created the chip, Chuck Peddle. They proposed using the 6502 in a game console. They offered to discuss it further at the science facilities after the show. Over two days, Moss and Cyan engineers sketched out a 6502-based console designed by Meyer and Milner's specifications. The model showed that even at 25, the 6502 would be too expensive, and Pedal offered them a planned 6507 microprocessor, a cost-reduced version of the 6502, and Moss's riot chip for input-output. Cyan and Moss negotiated the 6507 and riot chips at $12 a pair. Moss also introduced Cyan to the micro Microcomputer Associates, who had separately developed debugging software and hardware for MOS, and had developed the Jolt computer for testing the 6502, which Pedal suggested would be useful for Atari and Cyan to use while developing their system. Milner was able to demonstrate a proof of concept for the programmable console by implementing Tank, an arcade game by Atari's subsidiary Key Games, on the Jolt. As part of the deal, Atari wanted a second source of the chipset. Paddler and Palavian suggested Cynertech, whose co-founder, Bob Schreiner, was a friend of the pedal. In October of 75, Atari informed the market that it was moving forward with MLS, the Motorola sales team had already told its management that the Atari deal was finalized and Motorola management was livid. They announced the lawsuit against MLS the next week. What? Uh, in, in December of 75, Atari hired Joe DeCure, a recent graduate from the University of California, Berkeley, who had been doing his own testing on the 6502. 
The Cure began debugging the first prototype designed by Mayer and Milner, which gave the code name Stella after the the Cure's bicycle. Well, this <laughs> you're 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 now known as the the, the peddler of bicycles. Um, the prototype included a breadboard design level of the graphics interface to be built on. A second prototype was completed in March of '76 with the help of J. Milner, J. J. Miner, and created a chip called the Television Interface Adapter (TIA) to send graphics and audio to a television. The second prototype included a TIA, the 6507, and a ROM cartridge slot and adapter. As the TIA's design was refined, Al Alcorn brought in Atari's game developers to provide input on the features. There were several significant limitations to the 6507, the TIA, and other components, so the programmers creatively optimized their games to maximize the console. Now, the console lacks a frame buffer and requires games to instruct the system to generate graphics in synchronization with the electron gun in the cathode ray tube as it scans across rows on the screen. The programmers found ways to race the beam to perform other functions while the electron gun scans the outside of the visible screen. Along with electronic development, Bushnell brought in Gene Landrum, a consultant who had just been who just prior consulted for Fairchild Camera and Instrument for its upcoming Channel F that name's familiar for some reason uh, to determine the consumer requirements for the console. In its final report, Landrum suggested a living room aesthetic, wood grain finish, and cartridges must be idiot-proof, child-proof, and effective in resisting potential static electricity problems in a living room environment. Landrum recommended it include four to five dedicated games in addition to cartridges, but this was dropped in the final design. The cartridge design was done by James Asher and Douglas Hardy. Hardy had been an engineer for Fairchild and helped with the initial design of the Channel F cartridges, but he quit to join Atari in 76. The interior of the cartridge that Asher and Hardy designed was sufficiently different to avoid patent conflicts, but the exterior components were directly influenced by Channel F to help work out the static electricity concerns. This would be good because I have a lot of problems that way. What? Um, Atari was still recovering from the 74 financial woes and needed additional capital to fully enter the home mar control console market, though Bushnell was wary of being beholden to outside financial sources. Atari obtained smaller investments through 75, but not at the scale it needed, con considered a sale to a larger firm in early 76. Atari was introduced to Warner Communications, who saw the potential for the growing video game industry to help offset declining profits from its film and music divisions. Negotiations took place in 76, during which Atari cleared itself of liabilities, including settling over a patent infringement lawsuit with Magnavox over Rich Ralph H. Baer's patents for the basis of the Magnavox Odyssey. And in mid-1976, Fairchild announced the Channel F, planned for release later that year, beating Atari to the market. Well, by October 76, Warner and Atari agreed to the purchase of Atari for $28 million. Uh, Warner provided that an estimated $120 million, which was enough to fast-track Stella. Uh, by 77, development had advanced through the brand it had brand it the Atari Video Computer System, or VCS, and started developing games. Now, the unit was showcased on June 4, 1977, at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show, with plans for retail release in October. The announcement was purportedly delayed to wait out the terms of the Magnavox patent lawsuit settlement, which would have given Magnavox all technical information on any of Atari's products announced between June 1st, 76 and June 1st, 1977. However, Atari encountered uh, production problems during the first batch, and its testing was complicated by the use of cartridges. The Atari uh, was released in se September 1977, at $199. Now, equivalent to what it would cost today is about $960. Uh, with two joysticks and the combat cartridge, eight additional games were sold separately. Most of the launch games were based on arcade games developed by Atari or the subsidiary Key Games. For example, Combat was based on Key's Tank and Atari's Jet Fighter. Atari sold between 350,000 and 400,000 units 
during 1977 attributed to the delay in shipping the units and consumers unfamiliarity with swappable cartridge console that it dedicated to only one game. In 78, the following year, Atari sold only 550,000 of the 800,000 systems manufactured. This required fur further financial support from Warner to cover these losses. Atari would sell a million consoles in 1979, particularly during the holiday season, but there was new competition in the field. Uh, Ma Mattel Electronics in television and the Magnavox Odyssey, which also used swappable ROM cartridges. Now, Atari obtained a license from Tato to develop a VCS conversion of the 1978 arcade hit Space Invaders. This was the first officially licensed arcade conversion for a home console. Its release in March of 19, 1980 doubled the console's sales for the year to more than 2 million units and was considered the Atari VCS's killer application. Sales then doubled for the next two years, and by 1982, 10 million consoles had been sold in the United States, while its best-selling game Pac-Man, at over 8 million copies, sold by 1990. Pac-Man propelled the worldwide Atari VCS sales to 12 million during its 1982 run, eventually settling at 15 million consoles sold worldwide by the end of the year. Uh, in places like Europe, the Atari would sell 125,000 units uh, in the UK during 1980 and in f uh, 450,000 in West Germany by 1984. In France, where the VCS was released in 1982, the system would sell 600,000 units by 1989. Uh, the console was distributed by Epoch Company in Japan in 1979 under the name Cassette TV Game, but it did not sell as well as Epoch's own Cassette Vision system in 1981. Now, by 1982, Atari launched its second programmable console, the Atari 5200, to standardize gaming. The VCS was named the Atari 2600, or 2600 Video Computer System, as derived from the manufacturer part number CX2600. By 82, the 2600 cost Atari about $40 to make and was sold for an average of $125. The company spent between $4.50 to $6 to manufacture each cartridge, plus uh, $1 or $2 for advertising, wholesaling for $18.95, and equivalent to $60 in today's money. Now, like all good things, you're going to have competition. Now, Activision... Uh, was formed by three different programmers, Crane, Whitehead, and Miller, in 1979, and they started developing third-party VCS games using their knowledge of the design and programming tricks, and they began releasing games in 1980. Uh, Kaboom and Pitfall are among the most successful, with at least one and four million copies sold, respectively. In 1980, Atari attempted to block the sale of Activision cartridges, uh, accusing the four of intellectual property infringement. The two companies would settle out of court and Activision agreeing to pay Atari a licensing fee for their games. This made Activision the first third-party video game developer and established the licensing model that continues to be used by console manufacturers for game development. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Activision's success led to the establishment of other third-party VCS game developers. Uh, U.S. Games, Telesis, Games by Apollo, Data Age, Zimac, Mystic, and Comavid. Uh, the founding of Imagic included ex-Atari programmers, and Mattel and Coleco, which were already producing more of their own advanced console, created simplified version of these existing games for the 2600. Uh, Mattel used the M Network brand for their cartridges. Funny part is, is that one of M uh, Network games I still say is one of my favorites, mm. and it's a uh, it's a mock-up, kind of like the B17, except all you do is your <coughs> trying to shoot down other planes. Personally, I would love to get my hands on B-17. Um, now, as in addition to the third-party game development, Atari also received major threats to its hardware dominance from ColecoVision. ColecoVision had the license from Nintendo to develop Donkey Kong, which bundled with every ColecoVision console. Coleco gained about 17% of the hardware market in 82 compared to Atari's 58 and with third parties competing for market share, Atari worked to maintain dominance in the market by acquiring licenses from popular arcade games with other properties to make games from. Now, 
Pac-Man has numerous technical and aesthetic flaws, but nevertheless, again, more than 7 million copies were sold. Interesting enough, also, ColecoVision did have a way that you could port Atari games. So, you know, it wasn't just a case where, well, if you have an Atari, you can only play Atari games. ColecoVision made it so you could actually work around it. Um, Atari had placed high sales expectations in the holiday season of 82 on E.T. Oh, no. Yeah. The game was programmed in six weeks. Atari produced an estimated 4 million cartridges. But the game was poorly reviewed and only 1.5 million games were sold. Now... Warner, Rec Warner Communications reported weaker results than expected in 82 with due to its shareholders having expected a 50% year-to-year growth, but only attained 10 to 15% due to the declining sales. Coupled with the oversaturated home game market, Atari's weakened position led investors to start pulling funds out of video games, beginning with a cascade of disastrous effects known as the Video Game Crash of 83. Now, many of the third-party developers formed prior to 1983 were closed. Mattel and Coleco left the video game market by 1985. Now, as we had mentioned before, Atari would go through a couple small spirals. Uh, they sent 14 truckloads of unsold Atari cartridges and other equipment to a landfill in the New Mexico desert, later labeled At the Atari Video Game Burial. If you guys want to watch a clip on that sometime, it's on Netflix. It's hilarious. Because they actually wind up discovering not only the games are still there, but, yeah, they were. They thought, oh, let's just bury it and get it over with. Um, Atari, in 1983, lost, as a whole, $536 million. Wow. Uh, the site was excavated in 2014. Some thought for it was an urban legend, but uh, no, they were actually were able to confirm that that's exactly what they did. Um, they would lose another $425 million in the second quarter of 1984. Uh, software development for the 2600 essentially stopped, except for that of an Atari and Activision. Warner, wary of supporting uh, its failing division, uh, started looking for buyers. Uh, Warner sold most of Atari to uh, Jack Trammell, the founder of the Commodore International in 84 for about $240 million. Although Warner obtained, uh, retained Atari's arcade business, Tremel was a proponent of personal computers and halted the new 2600 game development soon after the sale. But pretty much everything as far as video games went, and, you know, video game day, started really peaking with the Nintendo's launch in North America of the... NES. Woo! So you I had, had yeah, and I mean, it, it basically helped to bring the uh, video game market back to life uh, with our buddy Mario, and just a huge library of games. Um, if you also think about it, there was Nintendo, there was the Sega, the Sega Genesis. One of my buddies actually had the Sega Master System, and I have to say, Again, I'm nostalgic. I love playing on the old Master System because not a lot of people remember it, but it had a great library and some really awesome games to tinker with on there. Um, but yeah, as far as the Atari <coughs> went, me. now, the one thing that's also fun to remember is that, like everything that we remember from our past, things come full circle. Atari has announced that they are going to re-release a copy of the 2600 uh, just in time for the holidays I imagine uh, you'll be able to play the old games and even some new ones that they have uh, an idea to take and program into the console but that was our little tip and uh, you know it, you guys think about video games you know drop some comments in what were some of your favorite games when you were growing up um, I loved uh, Pitfall as a kid there was one that Imagic put out called Cosmic Arc. Oh, it was annoying as everything, but a lot of fun to play. Um, and of course, if I want to go back to my, my, my original roots, uh, there was the game Adventure, which was always so funny because the way we would play it is if you use the bat, you could pick up dead dragons and store them in the castle. 
And then the idea was, was to try to throw everything into the gold castle and win the game. Of course, the only downside is that when you would reset to take and get everything back to life, usually the bat would come flying out at you, grab your chalice, and leave you feed, facing a very angry dragon. But those are some of the fun things that we uh, get to see with our video games. And, uh, you know, folks, have a good one, and we'll talk to you next week. This has been the Bearded Historian for the Bud Files. Mm. Good night, bud. Bye-bye.